ass, you the maid, so you back jump. I'm a savage, yeah. Classy, bougie, ratchet, yeah. Sassy, moody, hey, nasty, hey, yeah. Hacking, stupid, what was happening? Oh, bitch, what was happening? Oh, bitch, I'm a savage. Hey guys, and welcome back to my channel and another episode of Murder Meals. So today I'm not gonna do much talking, I'm gonna just really get right into it. So for today's case, it's just gonna be a story about toxic teenage love and just what unfortunately can happen whenever you kind of let someone manipulate you to hype you up just doing things that you shouldn't be doing so for today's meal i'm going to be making stuffed meatballs and spaghetti so again if you haven't already done so make sure you go ahead and like subscribe to my channel and let's get going today's case takes place in toronto canada it happens on january 1st 2008 it involves a young teenage girl named Stephanie Rangel. Stephanie was born on June the 3rd. So Stephanie was born June 3rd, 1993 to parents Patricia and Adolfo. The two divorced whenever she was six years old. They had another son together named Ian. Her mother remarried her stepdad. His name was James. Stephanie lived with her mom and stepdad, James, her brother, Ian, which he was 12. She had a four-year-old brother named Eric and a two-year-old brother named Patrick. So they were said to be a very close-knit family. On the same block as her, she had five cousins. So they used to always have little sleepovers, cousin game nights. And Stephanie's house said to be the house where they all would just come together and just hang out so much. Stephanie did have a soft, trusting core. She was just very loving and trusting with people that she met, always willing to give second chances. She was a very outgoing and creative girl. She had recently started at the Rosedale High School School of Performing Arts. So she was super excited about that. She loved to perform and to be creative with her look. She would change her hair color all the time between red, brown, blue, and black. She would wear dark eyeliner with brightly colored bracelets. She would always change up her clothing style. One day you would catch her wearing a tutu with some sneakers and the next day she'd be wearing heart, um, heart, those heart printed boxers over her little tights. I remember we used to wear, well, we didn't wear those, but we would wear our tights underneath our khaki shorts with our bands. But we thought we was killing the game. And she would get all of her clothing and things that she wore from like thrift stores and hand-me-down second, secondary shops, which I thought was really Cool, because they gave her the liberty to be more creative with the, with her clothing and just be able to explore more options because she wouldn't have to pay as much. She loved Avril Lavigne and she wanted her look to match Avril Lavigne, so to speak. She had recently joined a, a youth group at a Baptist church, so she loved listening to Christian rock and listening to Latin music. I just love that. She wrote her own poems and she loved taking pictures, whether she was in the picture or was the one taking the picture with her little digital camera that she had. And she would go around whenever she would see those little elastic bands on the street, she would pick those up so she could make sure that birds wouldn't choke. She just cared a lot. Now, although her parents were divorced, they actually had a pretty good relationship. Stephanie would spend her time between the two homes. It was said that her mother was pretty strict. She was allowed to have a boyfriend, but she had to hang out with the boyfriend at her home, um, at her mother's home. And she was able to have a Facebook account, but her mother had to have the password to her Facebook. And every now and again, her mother would, you know, just log in and check on her to see exactly who she was talking to, what type of activity she was involved in. Nothing too serious. She did install 
um, some type of software that would monitor the activity on the family computer. And I'm sure this was for Stephanie and for the rest of the kids in the home, just to make sure that they weren't on any websites or talking to anyone that they, they should have been talking to. Her mom also allows her to get a little nose ring, but she made her take it out every Sunday because Stephanie was a Sunday school teacher. And she just thought that was, you know, not the best look to have at church, which I completely understand. The fact that you let her have one was just, because I don't think my mama would have. Now, when Stephanie would go to her dad's house to visit her dad and her stepmother, Maureen, he was just as strict, but a little bit more. Well, at least Stephanie felt. He would allow her as well to use the computer. However, he would not allow any type of webcamming to go on or any webcam usage at all to take place. And... Her curfew was she had to be home by time it got dark, which to me, that was, it wasn't too bad. He used to always remind Stephanie just to be careful with whom you trusted and where you went with people. He loved and adored his daughter. He would call her Reina, which in Spanish translates to queen, just to always let her know that, you know, she was special. She was a queen and just to always you know care of herself and make sure people treat her accordingly now just like most kids around this age um at 12 stephanie started to get into boys and dating and at that time she had met a guy named david bagshaw now at the time david was 15 years old now, just some information and some backstory with David. David Backshaw, he was born to parents Ronald and Sydney Backshaw. They were separated. Now, at the age of three, David Backshaw was diagnosed with ADHD. He had a lot of behavioral problems and aggressive outbursts at school. By middle school, he, at this point, had missed numerous days of school he was suspended frequently just for various things such as cursing, whether it be at his peers or at teachers and faculty and staff, and also for fighting. Now, at the age of 14, David was charged with assault for assaulting his mother. However, the charges were dropped when David agreed to go to anger management class in order to seek treatment for his behavioral issues. Now, after this incident, he moved back and forth between his parents' house. And at a certain point, he had stayed three months in a group home. And based off of my research, I do believe at the time of him living in the group home, that's when he had met Stephanie. So at this point, David and Stephanie, um, they began to date. Now, keep in mind, at, Stephanie was 12 years old and David was 15. And he was a 15-year-old who was clearly in another spot in his life versus where Stephanie was in hers. They would meet at the park and near her house and have lunch at a local pizza spot, which I think is cute. She was flattered that a high school boy that was on the football team was actually interested in her. They did only date briefly due to the fact that David was just a little mannish little boy, and he did what mannish little boys do best. He called Stephanie at her home phone, and for whatever reason, he thought it would be a bright idea to tell Stephanie that he wanted to take their relationship to the next level. Again, she's 12, he's 15. He decided that he wanted to go to the next level and wanted to start partaking in the oral sex. Patricia, which is Stephanie's mom, she overheard this and she told Stephanie she needs to go ahead and cut this relationship off and just end things with him. Obviously, Stephanie was very upset. She felt like her mom didn't trust her enough to make the right choice to not do something like that. 
and she didn't want to necessarily end the relationship. However, she did trust her mother a lot, and she took her advice and just kind of eventually just went ahead and did it. No big deal. They hadn't been dating that long, and if her mom is saying something, she's going to listen to her mother. Now, after this, the two of them, they moved on with their life. Time went on, they moved on. You know how it is with kids. At this point in the story, oh, at this point in the story, it was fall of 2007. Stephanie was in the ninth grade at Rosedale High, and David had begun dating a new girl named Melissa Todrovic. Melissa and David had met at East, at East York Collegiate, and they started seeing each other in March of 2007. Melissa, she lived with her parents. Rachel and Zoran Togovich. Her mother was, which I found, found this fascinating, her mother was a nurse at a cookie factory and her dad was a mechanic. They had a very close relationship. The whole family was just close. Her dad would take her to hockey games and take her fishing. And they both just loved spending time with one another. But she was also very close with her mother as well. The family would take regular vacation trips to Mexico and to the Caribbean, and they would make frequent trips up to their cottage for the summertime. And they just loved doing those types of things. Melissa was a very smart girl. She was a straight A student. On her eighth grade report card, her teachers reported that she was a very considerate and helpful independent student in class with excellent study habits. Unfortunately, she struggled with very low self-esteem and body issue, body image issues, and just she didn't have a very good outlook on herself. She wore glasses and she had braces and she had a lot of anxiety and she had a lot of anxiety about herself, more so about her weight. She disliked her boobs. She thought they were too small. She thought her hands were too chubby and she thought her toes were too long. And she also didn't like her nose. She wanted plastic surgery to fix her nose. She thought it was too bumpy and she just wanted to get that on fixed up. Every morning, Melissa would take about 30 minutes to straighten her hair. She was said to have very wavy hair and she wanted it boned straight. On the days that it would rain at school, she would take her flat irons to school and just straighten her hair in the bathroom during school. She also, from time to time, suffered with bulimia. She, she was convinced that she needed a boyfriend to validate her, to make her feel like she was pretty and had some type of worth and value to herself, which is really sad. Oh, Melissa, she, she was no she was no newbie to this dating scene. David was her fourth boyfriend. Unfortunately, with each relationship, Melissa was said to get more and more unstable. On one of her relationships, whenever it ended, she actually resorted to self-harming herself. And with her relationship that had ended previously before she started dating David, she was very controlling and possessive. She monitored the boy's email and when they broke up she threatened to hurt his new girlfriend she even was going as far as to bullying the girl calling her a slut a skank and degra um, degrading her ex-boyfriend just talking about his clothing his personal style his hygiene she even talked about his appearance and that included his little pubic hairs. She just drugged them through the dirt. And at one point, she even told her ex-boyfriend and his new girlfriend that she was gonna have David come over there and handle them. So with each relationship, she just got worse and worse. So by the time her and David got together, you could just imagine how she was. 
Now, don't get me wrong, David was no angel when it came to his relationship with Melissa. He was unfaithful to Melissa and verbally abusive. He was actually physically abusive as well. At one point, he actually put his little hands on her and things between them were just super toxic and messy. Now, David had all of his issues when it came to school and his home life. However, although David has his, had his issues, it was clearly a problem child himself. David's dad did not care for Melissa at all. It was so bad that David's dad actually did not allow Melissa to come into his house at all. He didn't like Melissa for a multitude of reasons. Some of the reasons that David's dad did not like Melissa was that Melissa had to the nerve to sit there and leave David's mom these hostile letters just saying how David's mom was not a good mom and she also did not like that Melissa had took it as far as in, installing spyware software on David's computer so she could monitor him and see what he was doing 24 seven. Now, although Melissa had never met Stephanie, she just knew that David had dated someone named Stephanie once upon a child or once upon a time, but Melissa did not like Stephanie at all. David had once said that Stephanie was pretty or she was cute. And well, Melissa, she literally flipped her, she flipped her wig. She lost it. She at this point began to obsessively stalk Stephanie's um, social media and her pictures to just see what she was doing at all times. Stephanie at one point had um, told Melissa's cousin, had told Melissa's cousin, cousin basically that David wasn't SHIT and that he was flirting with her and other girls behind Melissa's back. Now, when this information got back to David, got back to Melissa, she was literally furious. Now, although they didn't know the extent to the toxic nature of the relationship, everyone around them could kind of see that David and Melissa were just not a good match. And Melissa's parents urged her to please break up with David and end the relationship. However, Melissa, she refused. She told her mother, who is going to look at a girl with braces and glasses when there's such more prettier girls to choose from? Melissa was just so upset with what she calls David cheating on her with Stephanie whenever he called her pretty and by him flirting with her that she wanted to find a way for David to be able to make it up to her so that they can move on from their relationship. So she thought long and hard about it. And after a lot of consideration, a lot of different options, the way that Melissa felt like David could repay her back and to make up for his cheating was by killing Stephanie. You heard it. She wanted Stephanie dead because her boyfriend cheated on her with Stephanie. And by cheating, he was flirting with her and called her pretty. And once the topic and the idea was out there, it became a center point of their relationship. It really became something that they obsessively talked about. On May 22nd, 2007, Melissa had accused David of talking to Stephanie. And whenever she found that out, she told David, I'm gonna fucking stab her. If I want to, then I'll just kill her. That's what she texted David. The next day, he told her, well, I can bring you a knife to school if, 
if you want. And she replied back saying, I already have one and I brought it to school, LOL. Melissa, she was a different type of girl. She even took it as far as contemplating having her brother sexually assault Stephanie. The two had discussed kidnapping Stephanie and taking her to a place where Melissa could kill Stephanie. David suggested that they wait until the school year was up so that he could have a car in order to have a getaway car. I guess Melissa, she did not want to wait. She got upset and snapped back at him. Fine, no sex till then. So at this point, her having sex with him basically came the threat, became the bargaining chip of him basically doing what she wanted him to do. Now, although it was very disturbing and just not a conversation that me and my friends would ever think to have at that age or a conversation that I would want my daughter or my son to even have, it started out more as a sick, weird conversation. I don't wanna say joke, but you know, just a big hypothetical, you know what I'm saying. But slowly but surely, the more they talked, the more they went on, a plan actually really started to form and it became more real as the days and the weeks went on. Melissa had told David that she had a dream that she was so jealous of Stephanie that she cut her boobs off and then she slid down her whole body and threw her off a balcony. Now, although it was mainly Melissa, obviously, who's wanting to have Stephanie killed, Melissa did not want to do it. She told David, I don't want to kill her, LOL. Like, I don't care if someone else does it, but I don't want to have to do it, LOL. So basically, she wanted David to do the dirty work and she just wanted to sit back and just watch. On March 20th, after much harassing from Melissa, David finally agreed to go ahead and kill Stephanie. David walked to Stephanie's house and he called her from the driveway. Now when she came outside, all of a sudden, David had a change of hearts. He couldn't go through with it. However, instead of him leaving, the home or telling someone what was happening with Melissa or even telling Melissa to cut the shit, he still confronted Stephanie and he told her, Melissa wants me to stab you. And then he threw his cell phone down at her feet at her door. When she calls, tell her I tried so she'll stop pestering me about trying to kill you. And then he just walks off, leaving his phone there with this weird message and just walks off, leaves the house. Stephanie was, you know, obviously shook to the core, like what kind of mess? And she immediately called her mother. Now, I'm not sure if I informed you or said this, but Stephanie's mom, dad, and her stepdad were all a part of the local police department in different ways and others. I believe Stephanie's mom did something in regards to like social media. I, I forgot to look it up, but I know that they were all involved in the, like the police world. Once Stephanie told her mom, her mom Patricia called Melissa so fast. Now why she didn't call Melissa's mom, I'm not quite sure, but Nonetheless, she called Melissa and she told Melissa to stay away from her doggone daughter. And you would think that if an adult is calling you and saying these things, most teens would back down. They would, you know, recant, backtrack or just something, you know, to kind of like cover themselves. But not Melissa. She simply replied angrily that, Stephanie needs to stop spreading rumors about her. Stephanie's mom at that point tried to explain 
to Melissa that that's not what Stephanie was trying to do. Unbeknownst to Melissa, unbeknownst, unbeknownst, whatever. Unknown to Melissa, Stephanie had actually just recently broken up with her boyfriend and, and Stephanie's mom actually let Melissa know this. She told her that Stephanie had just recently broke up with her boyfriend and they had broken up because he was cheating as well. And Stephanie was just trying to help Melissa let, him, let her know that David was not a good guy and she was just trying to help a fellow, a fellow girl out. You know, already she was into the girl code. And you think Melissa cared? Definitely did not. And they got off the phone. Stephanie's mom didn't think it was that big of a deal or was that serious. Well, not that it was that big of a deal. She just didn't think it was like a serious threat. She just thought it was just your average teenage drama and it was just going to work, work itself out. She didn't think anything would come from it. Stephanie's mom had returned David's phone directly to his house and she told his mom about what was going on and she told his mom to keep her son away from my, my daughter. Just keep him away and we'll be good. And both parties agreed that that would be best. Now one would think that after this happened, you know, the kids, Stephanie and Melissa, will kind of just stop with all their planning. However, that was not the case. This did not deter them, not one bit. The next day, David had um, messaged Stephanie and he said, what about Steph? She replied, bang, bang. He replied back, I need a bang, bang first. I want to bang, bang you. And her reply was simple. She stated, I want her dead, David, LOL. We've been through this, even if it takes you a week. So basically, if you want to bang, you need to take her out of here and I don't care how long it takes. We're not having the sex until you kill her. Now on December 15th, Melissa, she was back at it again. She was nagging and pressuring David, just telling him that he needs to hurry up. He needs to do it. He needs to get a gun. And she was basically just tired of waiting. He replied to her, I need a mask and gloves so Stephanie's parents wouldn't recognize him. Her response was, baby, she was, she said, cut fucking leotards. And then she just stopped replying back. She was just ready for him to get it done with and get it over with. Two days later, she threatened to break up with him saying, you're blocked until you kill her. And she blocked them. This year for New Year's, their, um, Stephanie's family wanted to make sure that they did something all together just simply because they knew it was just a matter of time, just a few more years um, before the kids wanted to kind of do their own thing and hang out with their friends on the New Year's instead of hanging with family. Now, 6.30 p.m. on New Year's Eve, Stephanie was having a get together with her family and David was actually seen lurking in a neighbor by a neighbor like in a bush area just like a little creeper he could be seen on his phone talking and texting and just sitting there just waiting and watching now he and Melissa called and text each other around 65 times that night he called Stephanie's phone several times that night trying to get her to come outside, but she never once answered the phone to come outside. Now on January 1st, Melissa, she was just ignoring David at this point. He texted her and called her several times and she just ignored them all. He was convinced that she was out there cheating on him and just doing whatever. She, he was texting her things like, I know you're cheating. I know you're with another guy. I know you're doing this and that, blah, 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 blah. And she never once answered any of his messages. Now at about around 3 p.m., Melissa finally decided that she was going to let let the boy breathe because clearly he was over there losing his mind. So she actually called him back. 
but she just continued saying how she was going to have sex with other boys. She was going to be on top of other boys and just doing all the other things with the other boys. And it was just continuously making David more and more upset. Now, after about a dozen calls and texts, David finally called Melissa at about 5.51, saying he was on his way to Stephanie's house with a knife. Melissa talked to David at 6 p.m. and then again at 6.04. At 6.08, David had called Stephanie's phone directly. Stephanie was home with her little brother Ian. They were just sitting there in the kitchen he was eating a grilled cheese sandwich and she was munching on some Doritos. Her parents at the time were not home. They were at some family member's house, not far, but they weren't home. When Stephanie got the phone call from David, it came in as blocked, so she really didn't know who it was. All she heard was someone yelling at the other end of the phone saying, meet me, meet me. I'd be looking at the phone like, what? Meet me? What are you talking about? Meet me. And I, that was kind of like her, her ideal as well. She didn't know who it was. She couldn't tell who it was. She thought it could have possibly have been her ex-boyfriend who she had recently just broken up with, but she couldn't tell. She asked, is that you? But either way, she put down her phone and she grabbed her boots and put them on and she told her brother that she would be right back. Now, little did Stephanie know that David was hiding in the bushes. He was on the phone with Melissa and when she emerged from the house, he says, I see her and then he got off the phone. Before she could understand what was even going on, what was happening and to even realize that, okay, this wasn't my ex that was calling me, this was David old bust down tail calling me. David jumped out of the bushes and started repeatedly stabbing Stephanie with the eight inch kitchen knife. One stab punctured her left breast entering into her chest cavity and going so deep to hitting her in the back of her chest. Another perforated her right lung and slicing open her liver. A third punctured her ribs and her stomach, causing her stomach contents to drain into her peritoneal cavity. And a fourth slashed her left upper arm. David stabbed her a total of six times before just running off down the street. Now at this time, Stephanie was still alive and conscious. She tried to drag herself, well, walk back to her house, but she kept staggering and just, you know, trying not to collapse from her injuries. She staggered across the street, but she finally collapsed on the sidewalk into a snowbank. Now, shortly after the attack, a man named Gavin Shoebottom, he was just driving down the road when he saw Stephanie just laying there covered in blood, he immediately hopped out of the car to come to her aid. He told Stephanie to hold her stomach as he called 911. As he applied pressure to all of her injuries, Stephanie was in so much pain. I could just feel for her. She was scared and crying, it hurts. He asked her, do you know who did this to you? And Stephanie, with a little bit of energy that she had left, she stated bags went that way and pointed down the street in the direction that he ran. Now, the man did continue to comfort Stephanie, just waiting for paramedics and emergency services to arrive. But eventually, Stephanie did begin to lose consciousness. Paramedics and emergency teams finally arrived at the scene and they immediately rushed Stephanie over to Toronto East General. Unfortunately, by the time she got there, Stephanie was pronounced dead, being the first victim of the new year, dying on January 1st, 2008. Now, why all this was taking place with David attacking Stephanie, Melissa was just waiting for the murder to be over. She even waited 15 minutes to call Stephanie. And when Stephanie didn't answer the phone, she was happy. 
After he stabbed Stephanie, David ran to a friend's house nearby and he threw the knife and he threw the knife and he buried the blood his bloodstained jacket in the snow in the backyard. He then called Melissa and told her that it was done. Melissa told him to hop in a taxi and come over so he could and I quote collect his reward. Bing. On his way over, David texts Melissa saying, I love you, honey. Can't wait to see you. When he arrived, Melissa being just so sick and depraved, she made David reenact the attack against Stephanie. And then after he reenacted this, the attack on Stephanie, they proceeded to have the sex. Nasty. And then afterwards, Melissa called her mom and she told her mom to bring her a latte. At this point, news had had gotten out about the attack on on Stephanie and one of Melissa's friends actually called her and just asking her like, hey girl, is, did you hear about Stephanie? Are you worried that you're gonna more than likely be a suspect in regards to her attack? And Melissa just simply stated back, well, who knew I wanted her dead? Cause I only told you and David, so unless you told someone, only you should. But I never did anything to her and neither did David. And then she proceeded to say, we F-U-C-K-E-D, L-O-L. She was just, that's all she cared about, just letting her friend know that her and that little nasty little boy did the deed. Now, mind you, back at the house while everything was going down, Ian was inside waiting on his sister to return because she said she would be right back. But obviously, she never came back. Ian called his mother saying, Mom, there's been a stabbing in our neighborhood. And then he emphasized that it was literally in our neighborhood. Stephanie's mom, Patricia, immediately called Stephanie. And when she got no answer, her and her husband immediately left the family member's house and rushed home. Once getting home, she was greeted and met by local police officers. And she wanted to know what was going on because I can't get in contact with my daughter and she's only 14. The police officer told her, oh, well, ma'am, don't worry about it. This wasn't a 14 year old. This girl was in her 20s. And Stephanie's mom immediately got nervous. She said, although Stephanie was 14, she could have had easily passed as 20. So after telling the police that, and obviously this happened right outside of their home, the police offered to drive Stephanie's mother, Patricia, and her stepdad to the hospital. Patricia said that when she got offered this ride, she immediately knew what that meant because again, her and basically her whole family was in the police force. So they knew that whenever the police officers drove you to the hospital, it couldn't mean anything good. Once arriving to the hospital, they were immediately placed into one of those waiting rooms. And then I don't know if it was doctors or police or a mixture of both who finally came in and let them know that unfortunately their daughter, Stephanie, was dead. And then at that point, they did have to go identify the body. Meanwhile, while this was happening at the hospital, detectives there was already on the trail, baby. The one thing about you being a crazy, toxic couple and doing all that phone calling and telling everybody how much you hate Stephanie, you want to hurt dead this and the third, they already had your number before it was up. So I hope you enjoyed the, because your days were done. Now, obviously we know Stephanie had said who had done this to them, to her. So police immediately went that direction. They had started interviewing Stephanie's parents, her brother, and several of David's friends and detectives and law enforcement. They immediately just kind of realized the toxicity of David and Melissa and just their weird obsess obsession with Stephanie and the hatred that they had for her and just this weird idea that they wanted her dead. So at 2 a.m., detectives went over to Melissa's house and took her down to the precinct for questioning. And when she was questioned by police officers, while she was being questioned by police officers, a police officer actually went over to David's house and straight up arrested him and took him on down to the, to the clink clink for his line of questioning. 
Also, search warrants were executed on Melissa and David's house. Also, their computer was seized and also their cell phones were seized. So they can get all the forensic investigation going and just see exactly what their communication was looking like leading up to the crime. Now, during the interview, Melissa was said to be cool, calm, and collected, baby. She politely told officers with no hesitation that yes, I did ask David to kill Stephanie. When she said that, they had at that point stopped the interview and they immediately put her under arrest. Later that morning, police re-interviewed her when she had been formally charged with first degree murder and she just kind of went over exactly what happened. She waived her rights to a lawyer and she spoke to detectives there um, at the police station with her mother being there as well. She admitted that killing Stephanie was more her idea versus David's idea. She said that she was angry at Stephanie, even a bit obsessed with Stephanie, stating that Stephanie had spread rumors about her and she believed that she was going around telling people that she was giving oral to multiple boys. This was actually the only time in the whole ordeal where Melissa actually broke down and showed any type of real emotion, but that was only pertaining to her and the rumors she presumed that Stephanie was spreading about her. She said in tears, quote, I said I wanted her dead. And I told him I might break up with him anyhow because things weren't going so good between us. Police said that it was just so chilling. They have never seen a 15 year old, let alone a 15 year old girl, show less emotion or empathy, sympathy or remorse for anything ever. He's also stated that he can tell that Melissa's own mother was just in shock. He could just tell by her face and how she looked. Melissa pled not guilty to first degree murder and her trial lasted three weeks. Her attorney argued that Although she sent all those messages and although she told David multiple times, she wasn't really serious and her threats of her wanting Stephanie dead were to not be taken serious and she was only joking and kidding. So basically they, they tried to downplay the situation. Now, 30,000 pages of a mixture of emails, MSN chats, and cell phone records were entered into evidence between the two of them. And these were all just transcript copies of them just talking about their murder plot. But yet you want to say that you you weren't, you were just playing. This shouldn't have been taken serious. But we have 30,000 pages worth of evidence. After 20 hours over three days, the jury found Melissa guilty of first degree murder, obviously. Melissa did read a pre-written statement to Stephanie's family apologizing, but she showed no real remorse and her family did, they didn't care. She was evaluated by a psychiatrist and was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. And after it was determined that she would be tried as an adult, she was sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole for seven years. And her criminal record would follow her for the rest of her life. So they were not gonna expunge it. They weren't gonna cover it up, nothing. It was gonna go with her. Now, David, on the other hand, pled guilty of first degree murder. And unlike Melissa, he actually did show some remorse and emotion during his um, per, um, trial proceedings. He cried frequently. He was um, seen a lot of times hunched over, just looking so sad and in pain. And, and he had also just kind of like buried his face in his hands. Just, he was showing real emotion. He gave a heartwarming, seemingly sincere apology to Stephanie's whole family, just saying how much he regretted and, and just wish he wouldn't have done this. The judge did say that she felt like Melissa was the puppet master and David being the puppet. And she also stated that she felt like in these types of cases, the puppet master is more dangerous and scary than the actual puppet. However, the fact that David still go, did go through with the plan, he still had to be held liable. So after also determining that he was going to be charged as an adult because 
he was 18 years of age. David Bagshaw was sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole until after 10 years. Now, Stephanie's mom, Patricia, she went through a big struggle, obviously. She lost her daughter and that would be hard for any mother. She said that the hardest time to lose a kid is at the age 14. You're holding the reins back and they're always pushing you. You have to say no a lot. You go from being the adored parent to then wanting to hang out with their friends more. Stephanie's bedroom remains untouched. The door to Stephanie's room is always closed and there's a note on the door instructing the nanny to not clean the room. Her mother states that she goes into her room from time to time just so she can get a sense of Stephanie, smell her perfume and her scent and just look at the room. But for the most part, they keep it closed because she doesn't want those memories to be tarnished at all. Stephanie's biological father, Adolfo, he framed the last Christmas card that Stephanie had just given him today, given him, what was that, five days prior to her being murdered. And he framed that. He states that I never thought I would lose a child like this. And he just applauds her for being just so smart. He said she was so smart. She named her killer and she was smart to the day that she died, which is true. In 2018, Melissa was granted day parole for six months. Stephanie's mother was furious. She felt like she didn't deserve that at all. And she felt like she never showed any real remorse. So why is she being rewarded? However, Melissa was the same Melissa and she was brought back shortly because she had violated the terms of her parole. They required Melissa to disclose any relationship that she took part in since her and unhealthy relationships was the basis of her crime. She had got caught up in a doggone love triangle and that girl got brought back to jail. She applied to um, have her restriction of her day parole overturned, but that was dismissed. She went up for a full parole, but that was revoked due to they felt that still, they due to they felt that Melissa was still lying and sneaking and manipulative and they felt like she still had work to be done and they couldn't trust her to follow through with her program whenever she was released. I mean, you just had, you know, day parole and you messed that up. Why would we want to give you full parole? David did also go up for a parole in October, 2021, but that was denied stating that he still had work to do on his aggressive nature. Apparently he had gotten to some altercations with prison guards and with some other inmates, nothing just too, too serious, but enough for them to say, nah, you're not getting out. So when they go up for parole again, I'm not necessarily sure, but until then, them tails will be sitting behind bars. But that is all that I have for today's case. Um, what did you guys think? Definitely let me know in the comments on your thoughts and opinions on this story. And don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already done so. Share this video. It will definitely help me out a lot. And until next time, thank you so much for watching Murder Meals. Fast shoot them, hey, so you back them. I'm a savage, yeah. Classy, bougie, ratchet, yeah. Sassy, moody, hey, nasty, hey, yeah. Hacking, stupid, what was happening? Bitch, what was happening? Bitch, I'm a savage, yeah.